Okay, now even as we get into uh, chapter two, um, we have uh, seen John introducing Jesus. Uh, we see how the first disciples were all um, gathered into his team. And um, now uh, it's going to talk about, John is going to talk about how Jesus actually starts his ministry work. Okay, so, uh, and it the way uh, John, this particular John, the writer, the way he presents it, it seems to start off very low key, you know, uh, not with a big bang, nothing dramatic and, uh, um, uh, you know, something that will catch the attention of the entire nation. It seems to start off with some, a little local incident in some little, you know, place um, among some um, normal average uh, people, not somebody influential or powerful. And uh, so we see um, this ministry of Jesus starting off in a very uh, almost hidden way, uh, in a very uh, low key manner, but uh, there is uh, great significance and there is also power in, uh, in, in this slow start. What looks like a very slow start, what looks like a very insignificant event contains within it um, um, certain aspects uh, which can which actually can uh, carry a lot of importance, which carry a lot of significance. Uh, we will see what we mean by that even as we go along. And uh, we'll also try to see why did uh, John put two very different stories together, uh, you know, in, in a, right after his main introduction. Why does he talk about the wine being uh, formed by Jesus miraculously? And then very uh, the very next thing, why does he talk about the uh, temple being cleansed? So uh, coming to the first story, uh, John chapter 2. Uh, verses one to five. Um, if maybe we could have one person uh, read out verses one, two, and three. So we are into chapter two now. If one of us could read out one, two, three. John chapter two, okay. verses one to three. Okay. On the third day, there was a wedding in the in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to, her, said to him, They have no wine. Okay. Um, yeah. My internet is, I think, slightly problem. Okay, no props. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, it says very specifically that Jesus' mother was present at that wedding, and Jesus and his disciples were also present at that wedding. So the story, uh, John starts off the story by um, presenting to us the main characters who are involved in this particular story. And he goes on to say that the wine uh, supply got over, and Jesus approach, uh, Jesus' mother approaches him. Uh, asking for his help. Okay, so um, mm, we, and I mean, most of us are aware of this story, and we know that, uh, especially, you know, in the ancient Near Eastern circles, you know, where the, the, the region where um, this particular story takes place, uh, in those uh, regions, the wedding ceremony was very important. Uh, or rather wine was very uh, played a very important role in the wedding ceremony uh, because wine was supposed to be a symbol of joy it was supposed to be a symbol of uh, of uh, uh, of prosperity and celebration so these are all positive aspects which the which you know this uh, object of wine was supposed to symbolize and so um, if you were to have a wedding in those times, in that day, uh, without any wine, it's almost as if you are saying, okay, this is not a joyous occasion. There's nothing to celebrate over here. There's no happiness in this uh, event. It would be the indirect implication. And uh, so in their culture, 
the wine would have played a very important role in uh, symbolizing that here is a young couple who has now come together and there is going to be a joyful uh, wedded life and uh, this wine is a symbol of this joy which they would be uh, you know sharing in their home in their family so um, so when the wine runs out uh, on day 3 i mean in those days they used to have a seven day celebration so it's not just a you know a two hour celebration like we have it nowadays uh, but it's also a seven day celebration and uh, on the third day uh, probably because this particular family is not very well off the wine supply runs out and maybe they invited too many people and uh, the wine was not enough and so the supply runs out and um, on the third day itself when you still have another four days of celebration to go uh, if the wine runs out that would really you know be very socially disgraceful for that family it's almost like as if you're saying that this new couple who has you know um, been wedded um, there is no joy in their home there's not going to be any celebration or prosperity in their home there is a, so all this um, cultural implications you know come into play and it's so therefore it is a serious matter and that is why jesus uh, mother comes to him and says they have no more wine and she's hoping that he will help and then of course we are familiar with the reply let's look at um verse four yeah maybe only the only verse four if someone could read out please Verse 4, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. All right. So um, again, there are many commentaries which will, you know, uh, comment on this particular phrase woman used over here. Um, it sounds very bad in our current day culture. Uh, but then in those days, you know when they were when they would use that word in the greek language it was used almost like a title i mean nowadays we have people saying you know ma'am and uh, so that word at that time uh, was something similar to ma'am so it's a respect it's a title of respect and over here it's jesus is saying you know ma'am you know respectfully ma'am why do you involve me is what jesus is saying and um, it's a rather strange way to speak because you see, this is his mother that he is speaking to. So obviously he would always address her as mother. But over here in this particular in instance, he chooses not to refer to her as mother, but as ma'am, you know, with, with a respectable title. Um, and why, why, why are we seeing this happening here? Because now she is asking for something um, and he would have to respond, not just as a son, but as the messiah who has now come she is asking him to do something which would involve his official capacity over here the purpose with which he has come here on this earth uh, so he says why are you getting me involved in this situation and he refers to her formally uh, with the title of ma'am or woman and he goes on to explain and say my r has not yet come and this word r is used um, in john's gospel again and again uh, with reference to the crucifixion and resurrection my r has not yet come and over here, over here so it basically is saying the time for my crucifixion and resurrection has not yet come uh, and i will just simply read out you know the scripture references where you have this term being used the word our being used uh, it's it's to be found in uh, 730 in 820 12 23 and 27 uh, and also 13 1 and 17 1 and in all of these places where the word our is used it is being used specifically with reference to jesus crucifixion and resurrection so jesus is saying uh, you are asking me to uh, do something uh, which is going to lead to something else. Once the miracles begin, once I start revealing the signs of who I am, you know, because each miracle is a sign, 
it's indicating that here is someone who is not just a normal human here is someone who is not just a teacher but here is someone who is coming in the authority of god as the son of god so all these signs all these indications are um, or these miracles would lead to the ultimate event which would be the crucifixion followed by the resurrection so jesus is saying over here uh, ma'am you are asking me to do something uh, which is going to lead to a whole bunch of events and according to the timetable which i have drawn up at the moment i am not supposed to be starting this right now okay so jesus is says my hour has not yet come uh, i should uh the time has not come for me to start doing these things and start revealing publicly who i am and uh, when jesus says this and speaks to her in this formal manner uh, uh, this is um, mary's response uh, we see that in verse 5 and if we, if someone could just read out that one verse Chapter two. Can I read? Five. Yes. Can I read? Yes, please. No, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. His mother said to the servants, "Whatever he says to you, do it." Okay. Um, it's it's interesting the way she replies. Uh, she understands what he is saying. maybe she did not really understand clearly what what he meant by my r is not it come and all of that but she knew that he is now addressing her not as her son not as her child but as the one who has come from god so she understands that very clearly so she backs off she does not pressurize she does not argue she just simply says to the servants whatever he tells you to do you do it so she is just steps back in faith in simple trust and she says now he is going to tell you what to do next and you just do that so um whatever decision jesus chooses to take in his official capacity as the messiah she is willing to settle for that okay so um it's a very lovely attitude that we see she trusts him completely she knows that he cares about this family you know which is like now faced with with uh, so social disgrace he knows that uh, the that jesus cares about these things and so in simple trust she backs off and she says fine whatever he wants to do let him do it and so she says to the servants he will tell you what to do you just do that um so we see two things over here in her attitude she knows that he is someone who cares she knows that he will do whatever is best for all concerned and second she uh, because she has that attitude of trust she is willing to submit and yield she is not going to push her own agenda and say no you must do this no there's no um, there's no argument over there uh, there's no pressurizing over there and uh, maybe we can have that same uh, you know attitude when we come with come to the lord with our needs uh, for them in that particular social setting it was something serious because when the wine runs out on the third day itself what is it saying about that wedding what, what is it saying about the future of that couple you see all of that is involved uh, it's like as if a black shadow is being cast upon that that young couple which has come together and uh, so because of all these cultural implications that was a serious matter for them and mary believes that jesus cares about these things mary believes that jesus will do what is best and because of her faith it's amazing jesus chooses to um you know push his agenda earlier he he takes the time table and he pushes it up little more early he begins to reveal himself extra early it's an amazing thing that we see over here uh, the power of prayer and in fact we see this happening in the old testament on many many occasions you know where god says i will do this and then the people come to him and they they pray to him they seek him and then the lord says all right because you have approached me because you are trusting me i will uh, you know uh, change the time table so we see that in the, in the old testament on many occasions um for instance 
in uh, the book of Jonah, you know, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, uh, we see that Nineveh was supposed to be destroyed in 40 days. And then the people of Nineveh, they repent. They actually repent and turn away from their sins. And God changes the timetable and he waits another 150 years. So what was supposed to happen in the next 40 days actually happens 150 years later in response to the attitude of the people. So there's great power in the way we respond. Um, Mary showed simple, complete trust that the Lord will do what is best for all concerned. And second, because she trusts him in that manner, she was willing to yield and submit. And we see Jesus changing the timetable in response to uh, her request. So uh, we're coming to verse um, 6. Um, we see that yeah, in verse 6 and then uh, verse 7, uh, where Jesus says, you know, fill up the jars with water. Maybe we could actually read these verses. Uh, yeah, we'll have um, Albuquerque. Um, yeah, if you can speak up. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, I, I just uh, see that there is there are two sort of um, aspects to the uh, you know the the you know the the reason uh, why Jesus uh, you know sort of changed the timetable, mm -hmm. and that is uh, one is you know the need of the you know of the of the people who were at the wedding and uh, you know the the host uh, who were uh, who would um, who really required to get that wine. Uh, you know, mm. on the third mm. day, and the other one is this. Uh, you know, is is uh, Mary who is uh, asking her, her son to uh, you know to uh, mm. do something with regards to you know getting the wine. Um, just just a point here with regards to uh, you know the request from from Mary, mm. because I mean, there are certain denominations where uh, mm. they feel that you know there is um, uh, you know intercession that that can come from mary even now uh, they feel that you know they can they can they can in a sense pray to mary and you know get get her to intercede on their on on, um, on uh, you know on on their behalf so i just want to understand um uh, i mean i'm aware that you know that we only pray to jesus um and god uh, god the father and the holy spirit but uh, uh, just a point over there i just wanted to get your your, get your feedback on that uh, yeah, in the in the New Testament, we see so many examples where people directly go to Jesus and place their requests. Uh, so it's not just Mary who had the privilege of doing that. Uh, we even see a beggar calling out, you know, he says, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. And he directly goes to the son of David. I mean, over there, he doesn't even ask the disciples to intercede on his behalf. He doesn't go to uh, Jesus' mother and say, you know, please intercede on my behalf. He's just a beggar, very insignificant, sitting there on the side of the road. And he directly approaches this Jesus and cries out for mercy. And Jesus responds. So again and again, it's very clearly shown in the New Testament that anybody and everybody uh, has the privilege, has the freedom to directly come to him. Uh, so it was only much later when someone decided to put barriers between Jesus and normal average ordinary people you know by saying you must go to jesus through somebody uh, but if you when you look at the actual uh, uh, gospels themselves uh, we don't see that happening um, there are some instances of course you know where um, uh, the the people they come for uh, with their with their little children and they want jesus to bless and then you have the disciples, you know, poking their nose in and saying, ah, no, 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 don't disturb him and all that. But even they, when they came, they came directly to Jesus and wanted him to lay his hands on their children. Uh, so um, always in the Gospels, the interaction is direct. Nobody uh, really feels the need to go through an intermediary to approach Jesus. So um, that is the kind of uh, spirit that uh, Jesus wished to convey to the reader. So Jesus always presented himself as someone who can be directly approached. Uh, so all these um, 
customs and practices of the church saying that an inter intermediary is needed an intercessor is needed all those things were, were things which people came up with long after these gospels were written um, so they kind of went away from the gospels when they were asking for all these extra requirements and conditions we don't see that in the scripture itself and it's always best to go with what the scripture itself is asking us to do rather than you know uh, go with uh, man made uh, um, you know directives and instructions which man has come up with so yeah so uh, we see many occasions where people go to jesus for help directly and mary is in no way involved anywhere on the scene uh, so yeah maybe we could just leave it at that uh, yes if, if we could have someone read out verses 6 and 7 uh, because um, maybe this we can dwell on one or two things uh, no, in those two verses, verses six and seven, please. Could you please read verses six and seven? Uh, Pastor verse Kenneth. six and seven. Now, ahead, there, yeah. now there was six, there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of Jews, containing twenty and or thirty gallons a piece. Jesus said to them, "Fill the water pots with water," and they filled them up to the brim. Okay. Um so he, these are uh, large water jars made of stone and it says that the they contained water which was used for the uh, ritual purification uh, so uh, the the people would wash their hands and feet uh, as a kind of uh, ritual purification indicating that on a daily basis uh, they are conscious of god's presence and uh, it's like a symbolic way of saying, you know, I need to keep myself clean because I'm uh, moving about in the presence of God. So just the washing of the hands and feet would not achieve anything, but it's a symbolic way of saying, I need to continue to keep myself clean because when I went to the temple with my animal sacrifice and the Lord covered my sins, uh, uh, now I am grateful for that. And uh, symbolically, every day I'm washing my hands and feet uh, to, to as a reminder to myself that not only in physically, but even on the inside, I need to keep myself clean. So it is some, just that kind of a, um, of a ceremonial uh, ritual which the people used to practice. And uh, so we see here those jars being used for a, um, uh, a different purpose here. And we will, uh, you know, look into the significance of that a few verses later. But right now, over here, we see that uh, Jesus asks the servants to fill up these jars right up to the. Um, he, you know, in fact, he doesn't say fill them up to the brim. It's the servants who, on their part, choose to fill it up to the brim. Okay, so um, it's interesting. If they had uh, only filled up a quarter of the jars then there would have been a much uh, shorter supply of wine and they probably would have had a second shortage. But we see these particular servants being very um, responsive. Uh, Mary had said to them, do what he says. And we see these people actually willing to do what he says. And they go to the effort of filling up all the six jars right up to the brim. And if you look at the number of gallons each of those jars contain, uh, you know, it shows that they were committed in what they did. They were sincere in obeying. Um, uh, so maybe the one point that we could, you know, take away from this is that our attitude of obedience and submission will probably determine the size of the miracle that we receive. Because sometimes we call out to God desperately in prayer, asking him for something. And God is there, ready to respond. Uh, but then there's something that we need to do from our side, probably, 
you know, something that we need to obey or something that we need to yield and submit. And the level to which to we do that probably will determine the size of the answer that we receive. So in a way, it's in our hands, actually. Uh, the more we obey, the more we submit, the more we are willing to trust, uh, the greater probably will be the answer to the prayer that we receive. So sometimes I think from our side, we restrict the answer uh, through our limited obedience and through our uh, kind of doubtful attitude as in, oh, why is God asking me to do this? Is it really um, going to help? You know, and maybe that kind of an attitude takes away from the size of the answer. So here we see these persons filling it right up to the brim, uh, which increases the size of the miracle. They end up with a lot more wine uh, because of what was uh, done. Um, now, even as we are, you know, um, I mean, whenever I just read this passage, I kind of think, you know, uh, here we all are living in the modern church, you know, which very strongly preaches against uh, drinking of wine. And uh, here we are dwelling on the very first miracle of Jesus, which is all about wine. Uh, so just you know, to clarify, even as we are you know, talking about this particular passage, wine was something that was a part of their daily diet in those days. So the wine that we are talking about in biblical times and the, you know, the wine which we have at a, at a bar now uh, today uh, would be two very different things. Uh, now, of course, there was wine at that time which uh, you know, was drunk undiluted and it would end up with people getting drunk. And it's not something that the respectable people would, uh, the respectable godly Jews would ever do. They would never, ever have wine which is undiluted. Uh, and you know, like it explains in so many commentaries and in all these cultural background uh, books, um, in those days, especially in the Middle East, uh, Eastern region where they all were living, uh, fresh water supply was not something that was readily available. Yes, they would dig wells. They had wells uh, which they would dig all over the place. But the kind of water, the quality of the water available in those wells was not always, you know, uh, very good quality. And uh, so for them, uh, wine was, uh, you know, fermented wine because it's fermented. It should have, you know, killed the bacteria. Uh, it was a, it was a, uh, an option uh, as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a drinking, you know, drinking option, a safe drinking option. So even the children would partake of the wine and which parent would ever give their child undiluted wine, you know? So it was something which was, which was very, very diluted with water. And uh, of course, right from the Old Testament, drunkenness has, is something that has been criticized as being sinful, especially if you look at Proverbs, you would have entire you know, uh, passages talking about how drunkenness is something that God despises. And so when we are talking about wine over here, we're not talking about, you know, um, um, something that is very strong, uh, not, not the kind of liquor which we have now, but we are talking about something uh, which was in a very diluted form and which was used uh, just as a part of their everyday diet. All right. So over here, we, we are not having uh, Jesus doing a miracle to get people drunk. He would never go against what is taught in the Proverbs. He is giving them a beverage which will not get them drunk in any way, but just something that they would enjoy. So that wine of that day and the liquor of today um, is not something to be compared. The people who did not care for the ways of God, they are the ones who would have had uh, undiluted uh, liquor, which of course would have made them drunk. That's not the case over here. Over here in the feast, uh, you know, uh, the especially the family that is performing the wedding would definitely prefer to have their guests uh, in their right mind and completely sane. All right. So, um, uh, okay, moderate drinking, is it okay? We'll not get into all of that now because, you know, that would take us very far away from our uh, passage. Um, it is left between, uh, you know, that, that person and the Lord um, because um, generally the world that we are living in and the kind of cultural significance that liquor holds today, um, it may affect our testimony as a believer. Uh, you know, so uh, most believers would say, I'd rather not 
even drink moderately simply because of the kind of cultural significance it holds today back at that time even a child would drink the you know i would sit at the family table and they would all have this diluted wine uh, it was it was different the cultural implications of that was different it was something which respectable families were doing as a family but now now you have uh, the cultural imp implications of liquor now today is so negative and so if someone sees a believer doing that they would probably draw a very different picture of who i am and what my moral standards are and my values are and um, so would i really want to you know spoil my testimony uh, so maybe we would have to start thinking of all of that so yeah it's a very valid question that has been raised uh, but um, uh, we would have to think about how will people who look at me doing this how would they be impacted what impression would they get about the god i follow what would they think my jesus more my my jesus priorities are when they see me doing this so the cultural implications of wherever you're living would come in you know because back then at that time it is a family thing the family would sit together and as they are having their meal they would be having a diluted wine so it is a very different kind of uh, cultural um, you know context of that day all right yeah so just coming back to uh, our passage here um so jesus instructs them and says you know take a sample of this Uh, water from the jar and give it to the master of the banquet um maybe we can um, come to the response of the master of the banquet uh, verses 9 and 10 so if someone could please read out for us chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 first can i read Uh, chapter 2 9 verses when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from but the servant who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him every man at the beginning set out the good wine and the and when the guests have well drunk then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now okay so even in those times where they would uh, give a diluted form of wine those who over indulged in it would end up getting drunk we see that in verse 10 where it says uh, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink so by the by the third day of drinking free Uh, the free wine which is being provided there are people who would over indulge and it would also in fact affect their behavior so um yeah it is true that uh, there were people who were not following proverbs and uh, being very careful about how they were doing their drinking so even back then there were people who were taking the word of god lightly but then many others would not have done that many of them also would have been careful about you know how they were consuming this uh, particular product so anyway over here the master of the banquet he says uh, this is very strange generally people wait for you know uh, people to uh, kind of get used to the whole uh, wine thing and then um, when people are not really noticing anymore then they would introduce the uh, cheaper wine but uh, you on the other hand he says to the bridegroom because he is not aware of who has created this new wine he says you on the other hand seems to have seem to have uh, you know saved up your best wine for the third day and he remarks upon this with surprise um now um let's look at verse 11 and then we'll connect it to the previous two verses if someone could read out verse 11 please verse 11 This is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciple believed in him okay so um, the wine which was created out of this water was of such high quality that this uh, master of ceremonies comments on it 
and he says uh, my goodness this quality is so good i have no clue why you have waited up to the third day you know to start serving this uh, is what he says and uh, this reveals something about the glory of jesus so jesus he uh, reveals his glory by helping that family uh, by saving that wedding uh, by not allowing a black shadow to be cast upon that young couple you know which is trying to celebrate their wedding uh, so he is uh, jesus is reaching out to them and helping them uh, in a very personal way he reveals his glory by helping them and he reveals by his glory by using whatever is available at hand i mean um, uh, this is not a very uh, influential family if they were a very rich and influential family their wine first of all would not have run out because they would have had enough supply so these are just very ordinary people and um, god just uses jesus just uses whatever is available over there in that particular place to do his miracle uh, so uh, using something very simple like a bunch of jars with some water in them just using that jesus uh, does his miracle so that also reveals something about his glory and then we also see that he has uh, completely you know uh, overruled the the usual the laws of physics and um, chemistry i suppose is also involved in fermentation yeah so he, he completely overrules the laws of physics and uh, you know chemistry in bringing about this miracle which shows that he is someone who surpasses the human laws you know which exist on this earth uh, the laws of uh, of nature which exist on this earth so there are different aspects of his glory which get revealed through this first sign so wherever the word sign is used it's a it's a sign of what is what is being shown it's an indicator it's a sign or an indicator of who jesus is and so over here we see that jesus is being revealed as someone who loves and cares is being revealed as someone who can take something very simple and insignificant and do something great and marvelous with it he is also being shown as uh, the one for whom there are no limitations the natural rules uh, and laws of uh, of nature do not apply to him at all he surpasses all of it so when the disciples see that this is the kind of messiah that he is they have already believed in him in the last chapter you know we see that he, they have already expressed their belief in him but now uh, they believe in a deeper way their faith in him uh, gets stronger and it's the same even for us you know when uh, even as we walk with the lord and even as we see him working in our lives by and by gradually our faith gets deepened it gets uh, more uh mature because of the experiences that we have had with the lord so over here when it says his disciples believed in him it's not trying to indicate that they did not believe in him earlier it's just reinforcing the fact that now their faith has become even deeper um all right now just you know um to uh to talk about other aspects of this particular story here in the story we have uh, uh, jars which were used for um, water uh, what uh, uh, the ritual of cleansing okay the, this water was being used for the ritual of cleansing and uh, jesus takes this water and turns it into wine and so you have commentaries which comment on this they talk about how the people were using water to wash themselves and clean themselves but jesus takes this water and converts it into wine and wine they say you know is a, a symbol of jesus blood which cleanses at a whole different level water can only cleanse physically but blood cleanses you from your very sins and so they talk about how there's a uh, there's a hidden um, layer to this story where jesus is taking uh, the whole process of cleansing to a higher level up to now people could only cleanse themselves outwardly they would try to live live better lives they would try to make better choices but now the messiah has come and he's going to do an internal work of cleansing which they cannot do on their own 
So he is going to cleanse them inside and make them into a new person with a new heart. And he's going to do that by his blood. And the blood, of course, you know, is symbolized by wine because Jesus says, drink my blood. And uh, they would drink his uh, blood uh, symbolically uh, through the wine which they would have during the communion. So um, even though this is just a very simple story where God reaches out and helps uh, a family, uh, we see that there's something more happening over here. Uh, there are deeper spiritual implications which we can see where we see a Messiah who has come who can take cleansing to a uh, an entire new level okay so that's one of the um, hidden layers of this um, of this particular story uh, which also comes out to those who kind of you know meditate upon this uh, particular passage um all right uh, we are kind of running out of time because we have reached 10 40. um what should i touch upon just give me a moment. I'm, uh, you know, just quickly going through. All right, we'll come to this um, passage on the cleansing of the temple. Now, most of us are already familiar with this. Uh, maybe we could just look at uh, one or two verses specifically. Um, All right, it says in verse 16, okay, we're looking at John chapter 2, verse 16. Mm, okay, maybe 15 as well. If we could just have one person very, very quickly read out uh, John chapter 2, verses 15, 16, 17. Yes. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and put out changes, uh, the changes money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciple remembered that it, it, it was written zeal for your house has eaten me up okay. so that the jews answered, so, um, answered him and uh, sorry to, I you yeah, no, that's okay that's all right yeah thank you yeah uh so over here we see uh that uh, jesus after seeing what the people are doing in the temple he um prepares a whip using a bunch of you know ropes which are available he makes a whip out of it uh, and uh, some commentaries have pointed to the fact that it must have taken him some time to make it. You see, he didn't come over there carrying a whip. He did not know what he would find when he gets there. But when he comes over there and sees all this uh, havoc and all this uh, you know, selling and buying that's going on over there, and there is no peace and quiet, and people are um, you know, busy thinking about money rather than thinking about God, when he sees that, it angers him and it, it says that he spent some time making a whip so this is not an instant reaction you know because uh, sometimes we uh, just react in anger and it may not be righteous anger uh, it is just uh, an anger born out of a selfish nature on the on the other hand over here this is an anger which is very carefully thought out and then expressed so it's not just a you know knee-jerk reaction jesus thinks about what is being done over here. He thinks about what's going on in the minds of all those merchants sitting over there. They are thinking, okay, fine, I've, I've made this much money now. It's afternoon. Maybe by evening, I'll make this much money. And there they are sitting, thinking about those things in the temple of God, rather than, you know, uh, focusing on...
Mange, is it my network or Master has lost the internet? I think it is her side. You are safe. It's her side. Okay. Very sorry for the interruption. Very, very sorry. Um, the connection just kind of went off for a bit. Am I audible? You can hear me, right? Could someone just indicate whether you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, ma. Perfect. Yeah. Very sorry for this. Um, all right. The point which many of the commentators make is that. Um, if you look at the uh, same story in the other Gospels, uh, they talk about how um, when Jesus goes there and sees all the noise which is being made, he's upset because his temple is supposed to be a house of prayer. And so he's upset that the Gentiles who come over there uh, you know, to, to, to meet with Yahweh, they are not able to stand over there because the area which is... Um, allotted for them the outer court where they where they can stand and pray to god that area has been filled up by all of these merchants who are selling their merchandise so they point to that aspect of his uh, anger you know they talk about how jesus is so upset that the place which has been reserved for the gentiles to come and stand and pray to yahweh that space has been taken up by the merchants and they are too busy uh, you know selling their merchandise and making money rather than leaving that space open for the for the gentiles to come and uh, interact with the lord uh, so that aspect of jesus anger is touched upon in the other gospels over here in the book of john we see the other aspect that jesus is very angry about not only are they taking up the space which is reserved for gentiles also, they are dishonoring God Himself with their attitude, and we see that part of the uh, of, of God's anger, of Jesus' anger, being touched upon over here in verse seventeen. It's say uh, in verses sixteen and seventeen, because Jesus says, "Get these out of here! Stop turning my Father's house into a market. This is His Father's house. This is the place where the God of Gods and King of Kings said, I will come down." and interact with human beings and make my home among them. So people should be honored that they have been given such a privilege that God himself has chosen to come down and live among them. But instead of, the, uh, instead of, the, of that, these people are not even thinking about God, but thinking about money making. And that is when his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. So there are two aspects that make Jesus angry. One, that the Gentiles have been denied the space where they can stand quietly and contemplate upon God and hear his voice. And secondly, uh, because the people who are gathered over there, the merchants, are, don't even care about God, have no respect for him. All they can think about is how to make more money and greater profits. Uh, so now, these two passages which seem to have no connection between them why did the holy spirit inspire john uh, to place these two particular stories together all right so um 
just a moment, please. The first story, if we see, uh, it talks about how um, cleansing is taken to a whole new level. God, uh, God introduces us uh, 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 um, indirectly, you know, through the story. God introduces uh, uh, a system where not just water, but wine, His blood, will cleanse. Okay, so there's a kind of uh, spiritual connotation to the first story and now in the second story we see the emphasis which is there upon his uh, crucifixion and resurrection because over here he says uh, when the Jews question him in verse 18 and say what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this you know they're saying what authority do you have to talk about what we should do and what we should not do in this temple and Jesus replied to that is that I am the temple so I have authority to tell you what should be done in this temple because I myself am the temple. And he goes on to talk about how the temple will be destroyed. He will you know, uh, lay down his life and be crucified and how he will again be raised on the third day. So over here in the second story, the emphasis is on how Jesus himself is the temple and he will be crucified and he will be raised. So the connection between these two stories seems to be that earlier human beings, all they could do is maybe try to clean themselves with water, but now they would be cleaned on the inside by the blood of the lamb itself. There would be internal cleansing and they would become a new creation. They would become a new person. And how would that happen? It would happen through what is mentioned over here in the second account where God establishes the glory of who God is supposed to be by driving out all the false merchants who are there and presenting himself as the sacrifice through whom people can access this glory of God. So they try to draw uh, that kind of a connection between these two stories uh, to point out that at a spiritual level, there is a connect between the two stories. Uh, you know, so... Um, that probably could be one reason why uh, 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 an account which talks about the crucif crucifixion and resurrection is connected with another account which talks about uh, not just physical cleansing, but cleansing through the blood, which is symbolized uh, you know, in the form of wine. All right. So uh, these are just some things that we could cover today. And um, uh, next week, of course, we'll move into chapter three. Uh, I know we are a little beyond time. Uh, and yeah, you have one more session to go. So if you could, you know, just um, um, post your questions, you know, if you have any questions, if you can post them in the stream page, you know, of the Google Classroom, I will address the questions next week. So we will now, you know, um, uh, leave. Uh, but if you can put your questions in the stream page of Google Classroom, I can address those questions next week without fail. So thank you so much uh, for joining in and listening and uh, we'll meet again next week thank you thank you pastor god bless you